So I'm going to um, present um, a practice-based research project that I've been working on called Landscape Composite, um, which kind of culminated in an exhibition that I had in, in Bristol last year in that little gap we had, we had between lockdowns, which was uh, fortuitous, I guess. Um, oops. Here we go. So intermediality in new media. So intermediality occurs when there is a interrelation of various distinctly recognized arts and media within one object, but the interaction is such that they transform each other and a new form of art or mediation emerges. Restrata. So I thought I'd actually start with a, a, a video recording I did of the exhibition so you get a sense of the space and the works within it. So um, I hope uh, that it, the stream's okay. Obviously it'll be a reduced frame rate, um, but you'll get a good sense of the exhibition. There's no sound, so don't worry about it. Oh, here we go. <laughs> there. Okay, so I'm just going to talk you through the development of the work and some of the contextual frame. And um, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll start. So the first work um, I created was called Women Home. And I screened it at uh, We Make Stuff in Bath, Imagine Faraway Lands in Bristol, and the Post Pastor exhibition. And it uses the John Constable painting of Women Home Park of 1816. The work was painted for the landowner, Major General Francis Slater Rebo, and shows his estate in Essex, and it was an important early commission for Constable. The estate now belongs to the University of Essex and has been repurposed into a modern university campus. Constable's idyllic view contains some men fishing and Slater Rebo's niece riding a pony and trap. I'm just going to show you 30 seconds now of, of the actual video.
Okay, so I started this work just after I started at Bath Spa University, which uh, some of you will know the campus is very, very similar to this. So it's a, a repurposed country um, estate. So I was immediately drawn to this image. And the difference in contradictions represented by what the image was and what this landscape now is really intrigued me. And I was really interested in, uh, at that time, the repurposing of large country houses and um, how they are used today. Um, as kind of her heritage entertainment centers. And that drove a lot of the choices of narrative elements for this tableau vivant. So I populated the scene with many of the aspects that had been preoccupying me at that time. Joggers, migrants, wind turbines, tourists, businessmen and women, maypole dancers amongst many other narrative elements. So this work was made with a real kind of creative subjective free reign. It allowed me to combine the animation and compositing techniques that I've been working with that also began the contextual frame for interrupting the Id idyllic view. Is that streaming all right, the video? Is it coming through? Okay, great, thanks. Okay, so pastoral painting, our composites. So in the introduction to the Art and the Environment of Britain's 1700 Today Conference, they state the British countryside, largely mediated by the visual representations of 18th century landscape painters, has now become artistic heritage, part of a national identity de defined by an osmotic relationship with exceptionally hospitable surroundings. The way 18th and 19th century artists represented, and in the case of landscape garden gardeners, actively refashioned a natural world on which cities impinged at a quickening pace, in fact, often bore the mark of an awareness of what they, they contemplated and plundered for ideas and idea ideals was in constant flux. Okay, so for those of you who aren't familiar with these images, the, the Shell um, company produced a series of guides for about 30 years where they employed artists to make representations of different counties that you could then uh, buy Shell uh, petrol or diesel to fill up your car with and go touring in. So here's a particular example uh, by Roland Hilda and the Sussex uh, Shell guide from 1916. Here's another example from 1943, um, not from the Shell Guides, but for a propaganda poster uh, by Frank Newbold, Your Britain, Fight for It Now. So in his 2017 lecture, Malcolm Andrews undertakes an analysis of this 1943 poster of a shepherd in a landscape by Frank Newbold. He examines how the image was made by using two distinct, distinct images, a photograph of the South Downs and an image of a shepherd with his dog taken from the Times newspaper. He states, the splicing together of the two different landscapes strengthens both theme and composition. It conveys a sense of timeless a timeless rural world set in sharp relief from catastrophic convulsions. The image contains a shepherd, a small country cottage, rolling hills and sprawling downland and composes a kind of omnium gatherum of iconic English landscape features. Quote. What he calls splicing, we would now, uh, what I would call within my field, uh, compositing a term used by visual effects companies, image manipulators, students with photo, Photoshop, and now HTML5 um, image manipulation software to combine images together. When we combine images like this, we do two things. There's a process, it's a technical act. So combining the images either realistically or not, and an ideological act, bringing two pieces of media or more together that will never link together to create new meaning. So as I kind of furthered my research kind of into um, uh, painting, I went back and looked at the Kenneth Clark book, originally written in the late forties, Landscape into Art. And he categorizes it into uh, these areas. So symbol, medieval, fact, where we see the invention of the real landscape, um, perspective and ac accurate topology, fantasy, Ideal, so idols, pastorals, and classical uh, reference painting, and natural vision. When I started to break down my analysis using these frames, um, I discovered some really interesting ways that I could build into my an approach that I could bring into my method. And this medieval approach that he termed symbol, where multiple temporal um, and narrative elements are presented in the one image from the Vic's viewpoint, became uh, an important aspect in the way I've started to produce works. Now, many of the 
pictures I, I use flip between fact and idyll, and I'll come to that in a bit. Um, fantasy also plays an element. Now, this is probably the most um, animated uh, painting there is. It's very often remediated by um, VR, AR, uh, people working in vis effects. Very popular image to be uh, uh, animated. And then Idol, which uh, quite a few people have uh, addressed throughout the conference. And I think this is the way, the main, sorry, um, uh, mode or category that um, I reference and then pick apart. So broadly speaking, this fascination with the pastoral uh, has multiple strands for me. And Terry Gifford, writing about literature, poetry, and uh, uh, walking, categorizes the pastoral for contemporary audiences as having shifted. So we now see elements of idyll, post-pastoral, and anti-pastoral. So in Sightseers, the main character murders another for dropping litter. I think it's a good example of <laughs> post-pastoral in action. Okay, here is a still from Witchfinder Jenner of 1960, 1968. So other writers such as Robert McFarlane describe the growth of the eerie pastoral. Um, so sometimes um, in this case, uh, there's, there's a subgenre in filmmaking called um, folk horror. And this interested in folk, folk traditions and folk horror and there's this rising interest in pastoral within these areas, um, as, you, as you know, films that Ben Wheatley and others could attest to. And what I really like this part, and I'm going to come to this in a minute, is how unhinged this is, that it feels authentic except for the 70s houses in the background. In this image, uh, taken in Serbia um, by Darko Bandic, okay, this, the, the narrative and landscape have become unhinged and shows this shows a group of Afghan men asleep on a cycle path in Hungary. And this image really stuck with me and has stuck with me throughout um, because in a way, semiotically, I've read it as a centre parks advert that had been completely unhinged. That's from a centre parks last minute deal advert. Okay, so combining painting and visual effects is my approach. Um, it's an intermediate approach. And my method is, uh, it's kind of simple and complicated at the same time as many think these things are. So I research idyll idyllic images, not, it started out just British, but I broadened it out because of the links across different areas that existed. And I pick specific images. I then digitally clean them to remove all the characters um, that um, I feature. I then gather all my narrative elements and I film them on green screen. I download or create 3D models and then animate them. I use stock footage um, and stock still images and utilize them all. I then composite those together into the paintings. As the project developed, I then found, like there is in the history of landscape paintings, uh, quite specific themes that I want to include, and many were there in that first work, which I've already shown you. So urban interlopers, joggers, cyclists, and walkers, farmers, shepherds, and livestock, folk traditions, folk choral, folk festivals, and the era pastoral, immigrants, gypsies, and homeless, and floods and flooding. In their article, The Role of Landscape, Art, and Culture, and National Identity, when and white comment, in the majority of John Constable's most recognized works, there are a number of human figures carrying out everyday tasks. It could be argued that Constable's art combines landscape and genre subject matter. It is a tamed countryside that is depicted. Okay, so within that theme, I then developed this work. Uh, so within the theme, folk traditions, folk horror, folk festivals, and eerie pastoral. So Claude Lorraine, known as Claude, helped pioneer the development of the ideal landscape, a huge influence uh, across the board. Balanced, harmonious compositions offering featured classical ruins known as Capriccio, and figures from ancient history or mythology. He has a tangible influence on British painters such as Constable and particularly Turner. Here a flute playing shepherd and his companion make music with a reclining nymph. A lusty satyr coaxes a rather reluctant nymph to dance with him. The late afternoon sunlight falls on the group through columns of the tr uh, crumbling temple, setting this enchanted glade apart from the civilized world represented by the distant town. 
Okay, so I'll just show you 30 seconds of this. Okay, in this video, we see aspects of folk tradition. Many recent inventions that explore this theme. We have festival goers. Hang on, let me repeat that when I talk. Um, a burning green man, dancing digital nymphs, uh, all separate yet together, uh, together for a digital bacchanal. The work was created during the first lockdown. I was forced to play many of the parts myself. Um, so I did want to find some. Uh, people to work with on this one, but ended up uh, green screening myself. Uh, see if you can spot me. Okay, floods and flooding. So this is Dead and Vale with the River Stour and uh, Flood from the grounds of the Old Hall East Burkhold by John Constable, um, in deep in the heart of Constable country. Sorry, this has got a... Um, watermark on it because I pinched it off my Vimeo. Okay, so Dead and Vale with the River Stour in Flood by Constable forms the basis of this work called Flood. The painting was chosen as I was looking for a representation of a river in flood to create a, a work loosely based on the 2013 Somerset floods. Even though in flood the Dead and Vale is presented in idyllic terms, no one seems to be adversely affected. The cattle gray is unperturbed in the background. I wanted this work to explore two aspects in relation to Gifford's modes. that of the anti-pastoral, the people affected and the hard work that goes into managing an active flood. And more broadly, I wanted to address floods to interrogate the post-pastoral mode to encourage the viewer to consider the way climate change is affecting our perception, or more importantly, interrupting our view of such pastoral scenes. Individual narrative elements that I previously collected were utilized such as the story of Somerset's King Canute who attempted to build a moat around his newly built house and it is this house that sits in the middle distance, the earth movers working in vain to stop the flood. The workers in the foreground building the sandbag walls were played by myself that were shot using green screen. The work functions in an interesting space between the post-pastoral and anti-pastoral modes. It encourages, us, encourages or confronts the view with the hardship and drudgery of, of the current climate situation. It also asks questions around land management and ownership with the homeowner now having built his um, own moat and rampart, rampart in the 21st century to try and protect his property. Um, the importance and development of, this practice, of my practice through this work with a simplification or focusing and use of the metaphor and symbols and a concentration on these particular themes that I'm going to take forward. Okay, Jakob Philip Hackett's Landscape with Motifs from the English Garden in Caserta forms the basis of the work The English Garden. According to returning to Malcolm Andrews quote of works creating an omnium gatherum of iconic English landscape features and Clark's false naturalism in this painted in this painting created in Italy by a German of a garden started by an Englishman Lord Hamilton and designed by Luigi Vantin Van Vitelli for the Italian royal family represents for me a perfect example of the composite landscape. It contains an imagined view of a reimagined landscape in the English garden, st garden style, copying the Italian style imagined by Frenchman Claude with fantastical Capricci features. And this is the work the English garden. So for the work, the foreground lounging, lounging ladies and cattle have been replaced by a composite digital map painting of the jungle camp at Calais. All of the tense features have been taken from press images at the moment of the clearance of the camp in February 2016. It combines the idyllic view with the interrupted view and uses subtle animation of nearly every aspect from the trees swaying to the, uh, in the wind to the fire burning one of the tents. The combination of the original Hackett image with the specificity of the familiar yet unfamiliar view of the tents, viewers have sometimes mistaken it for a musical festival, the new medium creates a sense of what Agnes Patho terms intermedial in-betweenness. In -betweenness. She writes, speaking of intermediality in Deleuzean terms is facilitated by the fact that intermediality 
has usually been described as a dynamic relationship between media rather than a sim simple assemblage of media coming in contact, into contact. Theorists often describe it as a performative act, a process and a displacement, a dislocation, transitory or interim experience. This metaphorical and literal displacement is at the core of my approach by this time. By concentrating on specific visual themes, in this case migration and geogra geographical displacement, combining this, with, combining this with the intermedial remediation methodolog methodology, it creates and supports the metaphor metaphorical space or the interim experience. Thank you.